Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, which we call Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, the past, the present, sometimes the future. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. Some of you might know me from my other Beatles show, a syndicated program called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts, first of all. One of the writers for Billboard.com. He also contributes to Axis.com, AXS.com. And uh, he's been at the forefront of Beatle news for decades on the Internet. And Hi. that, of course, is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello to all our listeners out there. And also we have the senior editor or the executive editor for Beatle fan magazine, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also another contributing writer to Beatle Fan, and he also writes for, still does occasionally, the New York Times, wrote for many years for their classical department, also writes for other publications like the Wall Street Journal, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And on the program this time, we have a special guest who we are welcoming back. He was the last lead guitarist in Wings. And he's here to talk about his new CD and uh, anything we feel like talking about as far as his time with Paul and any Beatle talk. And that, of course, is Lawrence Juber. Welcome back to the show, Lawrence. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have Beatle news that we will get to, but we're going to save it for the end of the show. Lawrence has a new CD out. It's his third CD of Beatle covers, and it's called LJ Can't Stop Playing the Beatles. Apparently, because this <laughs> is his third CD. <laughs> this, fo <laughs> this follows two other CDs of uh, Beatle covers from Lawrence, and we should also point out he even did a CD of Wings covers called One Wing. Yeah, that was Paul's doing. Yeah. Because um, when he uh, heard the, the first Beatle one, he said, what about Wings? Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't that motivated at the time. It took a lot even to get me to do the first album of Beatles stuff. I always credit Hope, my wife, with that uh, that mm. motivation because she was the one who said, if you don't do it for anybody else, do it for me, at which point I couldn't say no. So <laughs> she ended up producing the whole series and, and a fine job she does of it. So Yeah. yeah. So you, mu you must have enjoyed it the first time around because here we are with the third CD. Well, you know, it, people seem to like this stuff. So <laughs> who am I to argue? You know, I'm, I mean, for me, the musical challenge of taking a Beatles song and turning it into a solo guitar instrumental is satisfaction in itself. I mean, it's, it's kind of almost a, a transcendent experience sometimes doing this stuff. Um, so, you know, and there's, there's also, because it provides musical substance to perform for audiences that are, you know, substantially packed with Beatle fans. Right. Not exclusively by any means, uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, the Beatles have such resonance across so many different demographic groups. Mm -hmm. Can I bump in with a thought uh, or with a question, uh, Ken, real sure. quick? Sure. Lawrence, it, it just hit me that I think people think it's real easy to do that, to, to adapt these Beatles <laughs> oh, songs. Gosh. And I expect mm. that it's not as easy as, you know, I think there's probably a misconception that it's, that it's very easy. I think, if I, you mean, just, I, I think if you just listen to the record, you can hear how yeah. easy it isn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> real, really. I mean, I mean, it, they sound so wonderful, you know. I mean, how difficult really is it to do that? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's such a difficult question to answer because, I mean, I can do it because I've been playing guitar for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, but the bigger, I think the bigger perspective is that it's, it's difficult if you only approach it from a guitaristic point of view. But because I approach everything that I do from the musician perspective, so I'm dealing with musical substance rather than simply where the fingers go on the fingerboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it easier because I'm basically condensing the orchestration or the arrangement of a Beatle record into something guitaristic. And that's, that's a certain kind of art that uh, actually has a long history to it, but it, 
is not that commonly practiced. I mean, the, the, in general, the art of the arranger is not really fully recognized. I mean, and, and in the case of the Beatles, you know, that, I mean, we, we revere George Martin as producer, but how much he contributed to a Beatle arrangements above and beyond, you know, doing strings for Eleanor Rigby or, you know, or writing French horn parts or whatever. He made that kind of contribution. And so many arrangers like you know, Paul Reiser, not the comedian, but the arranger Paul Reiser, who came up with on Dancing in the Street, you know, do, 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 do. He came up with that lick. I mean, these are the hooks. You know, it's the same thing the studio musicians do very often is bring the essence of the arrangement into, into a song. Uh, the Beatles were so adept at doing that that there's also, you know, it's hard to figure who came up with what bit. I mean, you assume that, you know, George is playing a guitar line and it was his conception. But sometimes it might have been something perhaps that George Martin suggested or something that Paul suggested or, you know, like, I mean, I did And Your Bird Can Sing mm -hmm. on the, uh, the new album. And that's that twin guitar part ha in harmony. I mean, you know, kind of like you would later associate, let's say, with the Allman Brothers, you know, harmony guitar parts like that. And that required a lot of musical working out, not just guitaristically, but actually figuring out what notes go together. That's an, like an orchestration task. And right. it's really not that different from what Berlioz would have done with an orchestra or Beethoven would have done with an orchestra. It's just stacking the notes so that they have the, the most, um, most effective presentation. And, and so it's, you know, it's not just the song but it's the arrangement. So very often what I'm trying to do is, is incorporate as much as I can of the arrangement. And with Angel Bird Can Sing, you know, John may have written the majority of the song as far as the melody and lyrics, but those, those guitar licks are a whole other level of composition. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Very true. But on yeah. those, there were, there were two people playing them, and you're not only grabbing that by yourself, but you're also doing everything else that's on the track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, I, well, and you know, I suppose it could be argued that it's not that difficult to uh, to arrange this stuff, but it's hard to play. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And the fact is that you know, there's still there's a level of technical skill that has to accompany all of this. Oh yeah. Right. Um, oh yes. Mm. Lawrence, how would you differentiate this CD from your other two Beatles CDs? Are they very much the same, or is there a distinction that you'll find in this one? Well, I think that my playing kind of evolves. So there are things about this one that are perhaps a little different. One thing that, that struck me is that, and this is not just true of my Beatle albums, but all my, really, my albums in the last 20 years, is that I've spent a lot of time working in altered tunings, especially Dadgad tuning, D-A-D-G-A-D. -D -G -A -D which you know, is one tuning that one would associate, let's say, with Jimmy Page, because that's the tuning for Kashmir. Uh -huh. uh, mm. Al, Stewart, Al Stewart used it for Nostradamus. Uh, it originally came from Davy Graham, who wrote Angie, which Paul Simon had a very effective cover on. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, Stone's Angie, but A-N-J-I. Right. Uh, which is kind of like that's a famous rite of passage piece because you have to be able to play the melody and get the bass line moving at the same time. You know, it's kind of like a guitar, fingerstyle guitaristic bar mitzvah, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> you could play that, you know. So it's, but on this album, I used a lot more standard tuning because the songs just kind of went in that direction and. I, I was quite surprised because the first five tracks, four of them are in standard tuning, and I haven't done that on an album pr probably since the early 90s. So um, I think that um, part of that was connecting not only to the material itself, but also in the context that I was studying a lot of 19th century guitar music oh. and looking to the roots of fingerstyle guitar, which we might call classical guitar, but really it goes, it, 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 it's a little different from that. It's not the Segovia way of looking at things. It's more like these were, in that era, there were guitar players who did arrangements of pop songs and wrote their own compositions and did concerts and, you know, pretty much the same as we do today, except without a recording industry. 
Mm. And so I've been kind of studying, you know, that particular movement of guitar playing and how much of that ultimately impacts uh, the way that music developed in the 20th century. And you can look to all of that and see the roots of blues. You can see the roots of country picking, Chet Atkins, mm. and also through Chet Atkins, it then all comes back through George Harrison. Um, yeah, and one of right. you know, like uh, the, you look at, um, I mean, Paul, you know, talks when he's in concert, talks about how Blackbird, the accompaniment to Blackbird, was influenced by this Bach Bore that he and George learned, which they actually learned from a uh, uh, Chet Atkins album. And they're, you know, it's pretty musically quite advanced stuff. Uh-huh. So, you know, these are guys that even if they didn't have classical training, in a way they did because they were looking to all styles of music in order to to find their musical um, their musical grounding, as it were. Mm. When I listen to the recordings on this CD in particular, I hear a lot of what you were just talking about. There's times when I hear a classical style. Mm-hmm. There's some elements of jazz in there. And there's even, as I... As I when we were talking before in the last interview that I did with you, there's even a Spanish feel on certain tracks, like mm-hmm. Edgar Bird Can Sing and also If I Needed Someone. And it's all mixed together, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing, is that I kind of look at it, it's kind of like I've been a sponge, that I've absorbed all this music, and it just all kind of gets mixed up together. And I don't really draw those kinds of distinctions from one style to the next. Mm-hmm. I'm multi-genre, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. As were the, but as were the Beatles, after all. I mean, you can look to, you know, the, everything from R&B to classical to hard rock to folk, some jazz, you know, it's all in there. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. We talk about that all the time on this show. Mm-hmm. So many Beatle albums have a wide variety of styles, from Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, especially the White Album. So, but why is that? Do we think? Because they were influenced by all all these. Yeah, kinds. they were they were the sponges. But you know, but the, the fact they, is that it came to them because music in England has just more more of it uh, in terms of the breadth of musical experience that you know when i was in high school we had you know music appreciation and so we're listening to you know classical music and on the radio you could hear you know next to the beatles you could hear shirley bassey or you could hear uh, bach or you could hear you know louis armstrong you'd hear a whole range of different styles i think that 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 had an influence as much as, you know, all the records that they were listening to. I think that the, just the musical soup that we grew up in was, was you know, a, a, a very, there was a lot of flavor in there. Hmm. You don't think we had that in, in America? <laughs> Not in the same way, because your radio stations tended to be very focused on particular styles. So, you, you know, if you were listening to KRLA or, you know, one of the, uh, K, or whatever the L.A., Pop sta- AM pop station would be, you wouldn't then like transition into a lunchtime classical concert, for example, mm-hmm. which is kind of thing that in the 50s and early 60s, that's what the BBC did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you were listening to the BBC on, you know, it, on, in the morning and, you know, in 1965, and, and there was a program called Five to Ten, it was a five minute prayer program. <laughs> and well, you might have heard Paul Simon singing I Am A Rock because that was where he got his first radio exposure in England huh. was on a BBC religious five minute program. <laughs> um, you know, so there was I think that, that that kind of eclecticism, I think, is more English than it is American. Mm. I can see that because of the way the BBC was set up versus the sort of beginning of narrow casting i guess you know here in the states you if you listen to a rock station and that's what you wanted to listen to you didn't bother putting on the classical station or anything else but exactly. in the bbc you sort of didn't have a choice that was what was what was on 
Right, and then it then it narrowed down. Yeah, you know, when they really because of the pirate radio station. Yeah. Because of Red Caroline and Radio London. Uh, you know, the first time I heard Sergeant Pepper in its entirety was on Radio Caroline huh. when they yeah. broadcast it on the day of release, which was a very cool way to hear, you know, a mono Sergeant Pepper coming over the air from a pirate radio station. <laughs> but, you know, by, by the late 60s, of course, it had become much more stratified and you had Radio 1, 2 and 3. And so the classical stuff was just on its own channel right. and the pop stuff was, you know, but but there was an interesting phenomenon that I experienced when I got into studio work in the in the mid seventies, early to mid seventies, was that the BBC had an agreement with the musicians' union that they were restricted to a certain amount of needle time, mm-hmm. that they had to include uh, recordings that were made in BBC studios employing musicians. So if a record became a DJ's record of the week, it would get re-recorded at the BBC. And when I first started doing session work, that would be, you know, that would be a session I'd show up and we'd be redoing like a, a Don Everly single or some, you know, some American artist would come in or a UK artist and we'd recreate the record. Hmm. Hmm. It was a great way to learn, you know. Sure. Mm. Boy, that really helped the British musicians out. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because the Musicians Union had, a, you know, a fair amount of clout there. Right. But then, you know, but financially, they, actually, the American musicians did a lot better. <laughs> Uni- the American like, union is, is really quite, quite powerful, or it was. So, you know, I, I hear this record as pretty much a classical record, um, mm. partly because okay. that's where I spend a lot of my life. And, and, <laughs> and there are plenty of, at this point, classical guitar arrangements of Beatles things. Uh, you know, Garen Zolscher, you probably know. And, and this, there's a newish guy who just goes by the name Milos put out a record of... I haven't, of, yeah, I haven't heard any of those. Yeah, interesting. Um, your arrangements are a lot more complicated, and um, you know, if you well, if you yeah, publish I, them, that's an interesting point, right there, because I don't approach the guitar the way classical guitar players approach it. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of making more demands on the instrument because I'm trying to incorporate more stuff. Right. But, I mean, I can see if, if you publish these, I could see classical guitarists taking them up and making them into, you know, they're a lot more virtuosic than a lot of the Beatles arrangements out there. And, and some of the Beatles arrangements out there are by, I mean, Takamitsu did some and, and Leo yeah. Brower. I mean, people who sort of, you know, are good composers. And um, But these, these really are incredible. And uh, also, I mean, what struck me about the the track list was – there are a number of ones that, you know, if, if I were going to make classical guitar arrangements of Beatles things, some of these I wouldn't go near because there's so much going on in them, like Anya Bird can sing, like Hell, Hey yeah. Bulldog even, you know? Um, mm-hmm. yeah. um, and so many of them, and you've got, you know, it's on, on one hand, they're not by any means slavish arrangements based on, on the discs, but everything important on the record is going on in these arrangements and a whole lot of other stuff too. And, and some, you know, sort of jazz like improvisation around things. And I also like your, your arrangement of Lucy in the sky with diamonds, for instance, Yeah, there, Mm -hmm. there are times when, you know, when you repeat where the song on the Beatles record just, you know, repeats the chorus a few times, what you've done is, when you repeat it, you then focus on what would have been the harmony vocal line. So it's a line that you don't normally hear by itself. And, and I thought that was really interesting. Well, I, I appreciate all of your comments. I mean, I, for me, it's just, okay, it's a cool song. How am I going to arrange it? And that, that one was a tough one because I went through a number of different approaches before I settled on where I did. And it actually probably was where I should have started, but, but you know, sometimes you go the long way around. And I think that, you know, the, the, the difference between what I do and what the classical guitar players do is that I don't have, I, I'm not operating within that paradigm, which is a little bit of being boxed in. Mm-hmm. The, I think that, it, that because my background is so diverse, that 
I can bring that classical sensibility, but it's classical with a small C, not with a large C. Because the thing is that when you go to the classical guitar world, the one major thing that Segovia contributed, the biggest thing, just on the metaphysical level, is that he brought gravitas to the guitar, which allowed it to then exist, allowed it to exist in the classical concert hall. And so the classical players, you know, are operating within that, that they have that kind of center of gravity, that center of gravitas. I don't have that because I'm not being reverent in that kind of way. I'm just simply making music. And, you know, whatever genre it happens to fall into is fine with me because I just see it all as a spectrum. I don't kind of break it down into this is classical and this is jazz and this is folk and this is rock. It's, it's all just, music. It's all music. Mm-hmm. And, and this, you know, this is a philosophy that I'm espousing for some of the educational stuff that I'm getting into as far as helping develop some ways of bridging the gap between the pure classical guitar teachers and the kind of little kids rock rock band end of the spectrum. But there's this whole gray area in the middle where all the, the real stuff of music exists. And, you know, I've had such joy in having a career in music in terms of just what music brings what you know the emotional core of it the way in which harmony can or counterpoint can change the the texture of something you can have you know what might be a happy melody but but harmonize it with sad chords and it you get you know all kinds of interesting interesting ideas that flow out of that kind of thing and and to me it's like i get so much joy out of it that i want to see young musicians be able to experience music in that way and not have it be simply a mechanical task. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you had, you had said that while preparing this, you were listening to some of the 19th century guitar stuff. And uh, so it, can we expect at some point a, a, a freewheeling, irreverent LJ version of Fernando Sor and Maura Giuliani? And... <laughs> but I wasn't actually listening. I was playing. playing. I have okay. a huge stack. And it's not just Sora Giuliani. It's, it's players like Legnani, Zanni de Ferranti. Legnani was the Paganini of the guitar. Zanni de Ferranti. Berlioz said, he rocks you. Mm-hmm. So I think he could be classified as the first rock guitar player. Did you run into um, Giulio, Giulio Rigondi? Oh, Rigondi. But Rigondi didn't write a lot of stuff for guitar. Most of what Rigondi wrote was for the little button uh, concertina. Hmm. Um, he was actually, he was a child prodigy, <laughs> but his stuff is tough to play. Zanni de Ferranti's stuff is like ridiculously tough to play. And Legnani is just, some of his stuff is just so fast that it's like, how the hell did he do that? <laughs> but my favorite of all of those is Mertz. Mertz. Johann Kastner Mertz, yeah. who's like Schumann yeah. for, for the guitar. But all of that stuff kind of got transplanted to America and really forms the basis of the American classical guitar movement, which was kind of swept away by Segovia, but resurfaces really in the in the in the South, especially like with Kentucky and, and thumb picking and you know, that Ike Everly tradition that mm. that's Merle Travis and Chet Atkins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's interesting how all these things connect. But yes, yeah, certainly I mean you know and Fernando Saw is a really interesting one because he considered himself primarily to be a harmonist. Mm-hmm. That his primary thing was harmony, that the guitar is a, a, an instrument for accompaniment and you should learn harmony before you learn anything else. Mm-hmm. And I can't say I disagree with him on that. Anyway, let's not get too musicological here, otherwise... <laughs> 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 no, I just well, think you well, should record some of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, well, yeah. I have a, an 1893 Martin Parlor guitar, which is actually, you can hear it on on Don't Let Me Down and... Honey Pie, that's the guitar I use on those two tracks on, mm-hmm. on the album. And I am considering doing an album of, of American parlor guitar music okay. using that guitar because that would be very appropriate for that time period. So that's a possibility, but that's down the line. I've got so many other projects on the go right now. So. Okay. So over to well, 
as a matter of fact, just to follow up actually on what Alan, actually what both of you were, were just saying, on both Lucy in the Sky and Don't Let Me Down, I felt that the kind of the feel or the setting that you have on those two songs, it's almost, it's, it's, it's kind of a dreamy type of feel to them. Which is, uh-huh. you know, which is kind of the opposite of what those two tracks were, what those two songs were actually, I guess, intended to be. Hmm. Well, for me, I'm just trying to be kind of cinematic about uh-huh. it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think there is a dreaminess about Lucy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it's, you know, clearly, I mean, it's at, at some point I just have to kind of take all the information, the musical information that I have and then turn it into something that is performable. And that's the point where I might very well kind of stray away from the original record because I'm not, not always trying to reproduce it exactly. But it takes me, you know, once I get into kind of a, a, a visual space, an imaginative space, then, you know, that's kind of where the things will go. And um, at that point, I kind of, I'm done. You know, it's like it's I, there are very few of these tunes that because I can only do so many in concert. There are mm-hmm. very few of them that I even get to play live very much, you know, except right now I've been kind of trying out different ones to see what really kind of fits. Hey, Bulldog seems to be going over pretty well. Actually. I'll bet. Yeah, mm-hmm. all that. Yeah, well, of course, having seen you play Strawberry Fields and uh, I Am the Walrus, with all of these counter melodies and things like that, and you're doing them live, and it's just you and one guitar, I can, I think, probably, <laughs> you could probably handle just about anything on here, you know, <laughs> live. Well, and, yeah, it's just, it's just really, you know, but there, there's a lot of competition in my set list because, you know, I've done, I, I think this is my 25th album. And wow. You know, and there's just a lot of tunes to play. And I, you know, I, it's still, I still, I, I always keep promising myself, okay, I'm going to go back and do more of my originals. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, people are requesting this Beatles song or that, you know, so yeah. it's just the way it goes. I mean, I can't, certainly can't complain about it. It's, uh, you know, the audiences are there and that's, that's a very cool thing. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, as a matter of fact, on on the album, you do uh, you know two or three songs that people that you know have been done to death by you know virtually any artist in um, you know in almost any musical genre, uh, like was specifically uh, and I love her and something. Now, what was kind of your vision in looking at those two songs? Just wanted to get to a nice emotional space. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I Love Her was not really an arrangement I spent a lot of time on. And it wasn't one that was actually on my A-list, but I was quite pleased. Hope, well, more to the point, Hope was pleased with the way it, sh- it turned out. And one of the things I think that's come up with this album is that people seem to be gravitating to the repertoire because there's a lot of their favorites there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's again it's you know it's it's pleasing the audience which i think is a very really important factor how much of a challenge was hey jude that was a tough one Mm -hmm. Uh, for one reason because i I wasn't necessarily wanting to do it mostly because of the you know the ending and i tried it in different you know because the original's in f and i tried it in dad gad tuning in the key of f and it just i couldn't get the ending to work and so i dropped it down to e and then the ending made perfect sense. Um, okay. And then it was, you know, I think the challenge with something like that is to build a, a dramatic arc into it. Yeah. So, you know, I start with just just the solo lines, just the mm-hmm. melody, and then mm-hmm. gradually add to it. You know, that that was a challenging thing, certainly. Mm. But the um, but I actually was quite pleased with the way that one turned out. Yeah. And, and you know, hope is the final arbiter of (laughs) (laughs) Uh Well, that way, you know, because, uh, and it's not just a kind of husband wife thing. I mean, the fact is that as a, as an artist, you can only have so much objectivity about what you do. Sure. You know, that's why, that's why you have producers. And, you know, I think it's relevant when you, you look at 
the you know when we I mean my direct experience having been in Wings of course is working with Paul you know when we were doing Back to the Egg but Chris Thomas was there as co-producer and I think you know made a, a, an invaluable contribution to that record. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, having that kind of that other more objective vision of the artistry I think is a very useful very useful scenario okay wow very much so Steve I'm going to ask a non beetle question Lawrence if you don't mind um, okay. every time I've, I think every time I've seen you you always play cobalt blue and I've always wondered is there a reason? Is that your theme song? Is there a, or is there some kind of a attachment to that song that that? It's just it's a it's a good one to to do, in the in the set. It's a good performance piece. It's kind of it's not. I wouldn't call that actually my signature piece. For the longest time, it's a tune of mine called "Pass the Buck" that probably got the most coverage of amongst guitar players of any of my stuff it was ended up being used as a competition piece in taiwan for example a lot of asian guitar players learn it but cobalt blue is just one that it's fun for me to play and the audience like it and why not you know there's just i'm at a point where i don't want to make radical changes to my set Mm -hmm. Um, but i i think that you know, there's just certain tunes that I kind of rely on, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How long did it take to put the album together? Well, you know, we were in Liverpool for Beatle Week, and I played the Cavern a couple of times, and we, you know, just absorbing all that Liverpudlian energy, and came back to LA, and almost immediately in September started recording. So probably, I mean. The recording process was probably about six weeks, but some of those arrangements I'd been working on for a while before that, too. Um, Mm -hmm. So the the process is a little bit diffuse with stuff like this, because sometimes I'll start working on an arrangement and not even record it for a year or two. But with this album, the intensive work was about a six-week period. And you did it at Capitol? No, I recorded it at home. We mixed it at Capitol. Oh, okay. took the track into took the tr- the tracks into Capitol and had Al Schmidt mix it ah. because he feels like you know his the, the guy um, mm-hmm. and he always does really cool stuff you know and doesn't get in the way he just makes everything sound that much nicer and I like again as much as it's nice to have somebody else handling the production side of it as much as I I have my own experience as an engineer I'd rather give it to somebody that has eighteen Grammys. In that <laughs> makes sense. And, yeah. of course, you know, Al, and Al has you know some history with Paul because he did the Kisses on the Boston album. So sure, that's right. Hmm. Lawrence, can you tell us uh, beyond uh, the fans of yours who know you mainly from being in Wings? Your audience is it primarily at least? Do, do you feel that it's more of a jazz audience or? Yeah. And where where around the world, beyond the U.S., has your music been best received? Uh, well, it goes over very well in Asia. I've toured in Japan, in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea. I seem to have an, a, a very solid audience in Germany. Uh, oh. And I, I played in Italy a bunch of times, too. Uh, and the Czech Republic, they seem to like me as well. And, you know, there's still places that I have to go. I get, you know, constantly getting asked, oh, will you go to Israel or South Africa or or wherever? And I'm finally, it looks like we're going to go to Australia in um, February because our Gilligan's Island musical is getting a a premiere in Melbourne. So stuff like that kind of, you know, when there's an opportunity to go somewhere, then I'll, you know, set up some gigs. But, But the reality of it is, you know, I had 30 years of being a studio musician. So mm. even when I was out gigging, it would be, you know, I'd leave on a Wednesday, come back early Sunday morning and be in the studio on, you know, Sunday afternoon doing, you know, Home Improvement or Seventh Heaven or, or, or a, you know, a Danny Elfman score or something like mm. that. And it wasn't really until the studio work started dying down and, and my kids were out of the house that I started uh, ramping up the touring. But I'm still, you know, I mean, the most I got to was 100 dates a year which by comparison with some of my peers is, is, you know, a fraction of what they do. 
but so I, I kind of pace myself with all of this because you know I don't want to just do myself in on the road either. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, there's a few places that I still want to go and and intend to, and we'll um, we'll see kind of where it all goes. But those are the territories certainly where I have um, where I have a following. Canada too it seems um, I'm going to be in Vancouver at the end of April. And I, there are other places I've been invited that I, it just hasn't worked out to go. I mean, I was asked to go back to China in July, but it's not on the agenda for this year. Hmm. And would you say your audience is, is primarily like a jazz audience? No, and, and it really where, isn't. Hmm. No, I mean, my audience is a guitar audience and a Beatle audience. And hmm. increasingly, a kind of just a general music audience. Uh, you know, if okay. I go play a performing arts center, for example, then... Though I would say probably the majority of the audience are going to be people who just go to concerts at, at that particular venue. And then there's going to be a component of guitar players. They're usually the ones in the front row, like who, whose eyes are glued to my fingers. Um, there's always, there's always, a conting, always a contingent of Beatles fans, you know, like Beatlefest people or you know, just mm-hmm. people that I've run into, you know, over the years so and yes there are some jazz fans i mean i play occasionally play jazz venues but the jazz world is a very it's a bit compartmentalized um Mm. but i don't really i've not worked in that that genre specifically although my next album that I'm I'm toying with the idea of having it be a more jazz oriented record and like for example in a couple of weeks i'll be playing John Pisano, who's great um, kind of jazz guitar player, who's kind of like the the senior jazz guitar player in L.A. at this point, uh, does every Tuesday night, he does jazz guitar night. And I do that once or twice a year, and I'll be doing it in a couple of weeks. And I'll have a bass player, and John will play with me. And we may not have a drummer, I'm not sure. But we'll um, we'll do a bunch of jazz standards. And, you know, so there's a lot of improvisation in what I do, uh, but I'm just as happy. I mean, the week before that, I'm getting up uh, to play at a benefit for gu- guitarist Jerry Donahue, who had played. Um, Jerry used to play with Fairport Convention, amongst other English. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a stroke last year, which is unfortunate. So we're, we're doing a fundraising concert for him. It's me. It's Albert Lee, John Jorgensen, uh, Carl Verheyen. There's a lot of L.A. area pro guitar players. Freebo is going to be, I think, the MC of the whole thing. Um, remember Freebo from um, Bonnie Raitt's bass player? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. He is now, he travels as a solo folk performer. But we do this concert, and I'm going to be playing electric guitar as well as acoustic. I mean, I've done some gigs you know, in the last year with Albert where I actually f- really get to play electric again. And, and I enjoy doing that, but you know, I tend to be much more improvisational when I'm on electric than when I'm on acoustic because there's other musicians supporting me. So I'm not having to play all the parts. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just mentioning the jazz element of it all because I'm trying to think beyond your Beatles covers and wings covers, where your music might make the most sense on radio. And a lot of what you do, the other stuff that you've recorded, I could hear on contemporary jazz stations. Except that the, the playlists on contemporary jazz stations are, are pretty restrictive. Mm. Uh, mm. You'll hear me on Sirius. They play me on Coffee House. They play me on the Spa Channel. Um, <laughs> they play, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, don't knock it. it. It's airplay. <laughs> hey, I mean, I just, you know, I get a lot of airplay on Pandora for my Christmas stuff. Mm. Um, mm. And, you know, fingerstyle guitar can go into it. Like, like, how do you file Chet Atkins? You know, yeah, exactly. and and Guy Van oh, Duzer, yeah. for instance, thinks of himself as a jazz player, but a lot of what he plays isn't jazz. And you know, see, I wouldn't consider him a jazz player. I consider him to be a fingerstyle player. And fingerstyle encompasses all the the different all the different genres. Yeah, you know, I mean, Charlie Bird was a classical guitar player who played jazz on a nylon string guitar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he was basically a jazz guitar player because that was the genre that he worked in. You know, Barney Castle played on hundreds of hit pop records, but was a jazz guitar player in an era where jazz guitar actually had marketability. 
you know, the problem with the genres is, are you marketable in that particular genre? Um, you know, the fact, I mean, Paul's Kisses on the Bottom album got some airplay on jazz mm -hmm. radio stations, yeah. but in spite of the fact that it's Paul McCartney, his not, last name isn't Marsalis. You know, it doesn't, <laughs> right. it doesn't right. fit into that, yeah. that more traditional kind of jazz you know, context. Uh, something similar happened with Smokey Robinson did an album, you know, that, that could be considered a jazz record. And they couldn't get airplay on it hmm. because those, those radio stations just don't work that way. But, you know, now you have the different serious channels and, you know, you can Spotify, Pandora. I mean, that's where I get, that's where I actually get the real airplay. And on some NPR stations, we'll, we'll play stuff. But, you know, a lot of music on NPR is just bumpers between the news and the traffic. I mean, um, mm. mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I just want to ask something because she had brought up Chris Thomas a few moments ago. And all throughout the 70s, with the exception of Live and Let Die, Paul produced all of his music entirely by himself. Mm -hmm. And then when you got to Back to the Egg, you had Chris Thomas sharing that with Paul. And then ever since then, with a few exceptions like McCartney, too, he's always used a producer that was contemporary of the time, whether it's right. Hugh Padgham or um, uh, Nigel Godrich, whoever. And now mm -hmm. he's working with Adele's producer. Right. So what is the difference that you see? I mean, you saw it firsthand on Back, Back to the Egg. How much of an influence is the producer in shaping uh, a record with Paul? I think you get a tighter record without letting Paul have the final say. I mean, if it's ironic for all of its success, Band on the Run, for example, really, you know, it's not the tightest album. You know, I mean, Paul is actually a very good drummer, but some of his drum fills are, you know, they're not quite where Denny Sywell would have put them, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you don't, you know, you, he doesn't have that other person cracking the whip. Now, mm -hmm. just I say that, but, you know, I think Linda did have a production impact. I think that Linda would would help direct Paul. At least that was my perception of it. Mm -hmm. But I just think that it makes sense from an artist's point of view, if you don't have to be responsible for production, then you've got somebody else who can say, do it again to do it cleaner, or why don't we bring in so-and-so to play drums, for example, you know. I think it just gives, uh, it, it gives a broader, a, a, a better perspective. And, and I think it's a sensible choice for him. Because, yes, he could produce all of these records himself. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but he doesn't have to. And I think that that, you know, that helps provide that extra level of objectivity. Okay. But having said that, I mean, yeah. I have to say, I found him to be an, an excellent producer in terms of bringing stuff out of me that he will draw the talent out mm -hmm. in a very effective way. Because of the fact that he produced, co-produced Back to the Egg and then later Run Devil Run, which was very edgy for, uh, you know, an album of 50s and all. Do you think that Chris was brought in specifically for that purpose when Paul yes. needed more of an edge? Yes. I think the intention was that it should it should be more of a rock album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think and that it, that was the intention. Yeah, and you remember, think Chris it would have been it would have been less it would have been less of a rock album had had Chris not been there. I, I think that's probably the case, mm -hmm. but it's hard to speculate with all of this stuff. I mean, it's because it didn't happen that way. It happened the way that it did. Yeah. Right. And 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 I think effectively so. But um, you know, that album seems to still actually sound pretty fresh. Um, doesn't sound dated. Back to the egg we're talking about. Yeah, back to the mm -hmm. egg. Yeah. So my, and I've discovered you know, that there's this substantial fan base for that record. <laughs> you know, a lot of people oh, yeah. tell me that was, that was how they found the Beatles, was really through, you know, through Wings and Back to the Egg. Mm-hmm. So and tell him to re tell him to reissue it. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, every time I see him, I tell him to reissue it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did revive Baby's Request for for uh, Kisses on the Bottom sessions. Yeah, um, and when yeah. you when you talk about him bringing 
the best out of you um, is baby's request is it was uh, for some reason what came to mind you know that gu- the guitar intro and was um can you think of specific things that he brought out of you that that you remember well I, I, what i remember for example is doing the solo work on spin it on mm. and sitting you know sitting in the control room with him and just you know eyeball you know just eye to eye making it happen that was i think pretty potent uh, Baby's Request, I mean, we were just doing a demo for the Mills Brothers, so I just tossed off that opening guitar lick. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's pretty memorable, was, though. <laughs> mm. It seems mm-hmm. like it, yeah. But, you know, sometimes, I mean, that's the transcendent part of studio work, of being in a studio and, and coming up with something that was like, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, then having to learn it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hmm. Lawrence, I think you too just if we didn't ask you about your daughter. Yeah, that's oh, what I was just okay. going to ask. Well, Ilse, yeah, Ilse Juba, she is now becoming really quite a successful songwriter. Mm-hmm. And um, it's very exciting. I mean, she, she co-wrote All Night that is on Beyonce's Lemonade album. Currently, she has records on the charts with Shawn Mendes, a song called Mercy, which he did on Saturday Night Live a few months ago. Uh, there's a, a DJ named B, uh, Martin Garrix uh, has a song BB Rex in the name of love. Last year she had a a, a hit with Powerful uh, that Ellie Goulding sang for Major Lazer. It's just so much stuff. It goes back to Fireball. Pitbull's Fireball was the first one, and there's all kinds of stuff in the pipeline. And it's again, you know, talking about eclectic writing. I mean, she's she's written for Britney Spears for Mariah Carey. Train, Lincoln Park, Dixie Chicks, Janelle Monet, really kind of across the board in the pop spectrum. And yeah. it's really very exciting. She was in Oslo, uh, Norway, a couple of weeks ago, and then now, now she's in Jamaica. I mean, <laughs> she goes to writing camps all over the world. And what's funny thing is that one of her writing partners is Sarah Hudson, Mark Hudson's daughter. Mm-hmm. Ah, really? Oh, world. Yeah, yeah because, because Sarah has become a very successful songwriter too. So, you know, it, it's all kind of it's the family business, as it were. Mm. And what about the uh, the the uh, the nasty housewives? <laughs> well, you know, Hope used to have this group, the Housewives, a comedy rock and roll band, uh, back in the late eighties, early nineties, and and one of the the other singers in that was Maggie Mayle, John Mayle's wife. Mm. So when we do like gigs at local clubs, John John would come out and play harmonica with us. It was really cool, a lot of fun. But you know, she recently revived it uh, as the Nasty Housewives, uh, doing basically political protest songs. So the first one we did was overrated. Um, right. I was going to do it as a, a parody of I Want to Be Sedated, the Ramones, but, <laughs> but mm. I, I asked the publisher if we could get a, a sync license so we could put a video up on YouTube, and they said no. So we just made it our own song and took it away from you know that, that parody idea. And then it, it just kind of evolved, and um, there's a whole bunch of videos on YouTube on their channel, the Bowling Green Massacre, um, Dress <laughs> Uh, Dress like a woman. Um, alternative facts. Uh, One that's uh, uh. go up. I think probably later on this week, if they get the video finished in time, is uh, is in his eyes is the, the the myth of Narcissus and Echo, and um, you know, there's some discussion of of our president as being you know a narcissist, and rather than kind of tackling that head on, it's more of an oblique kind of almost like an Alan Parsons, Al Stewart kind of track. Uh-huh. Turned out really interesting. And then there's, we've got a few others that we're, we're working on. There's a bossa nova, let's go down to Mar-a-Lago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I think it's also possible that before we even get, you know, we'll do a digital release on the album sometime in the summer, but before we even get there, the, you know, the entire administration may very well implode. So, <laughs> we, you know, but, let's hope so. <laughs> well, let's hope. It's kind of curious to be doing a project and kind of hope that it becomes irrelevant, you know. But, yeah. <laughs> but still, there's an artistic angle to it. And then, you know, everything else that's going on. I mean, I've, I've been doing a fair amount of touring for this new album, and I've, 
working on you know, material for the next one and working on our Gilligan's Island m- musical, getting that ready. And then there's a, a, a new musical um, that is going to get uh, announced um, in a couple of weeks um, that I've been working on, which is all Dan Fogelberg songs. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. A music consultant and arranger for that. It's called Part of the Plan. Right. Yeah. A real quick, curious story about it. Um, Kate Atkinson, who who started developing it some six years ago, used to live in our house. We would, you know, we frequently we take in strays. Uh, <laughs> when the kids were little, it was kind of handy because Hope and I could go out on the road and we'd have somebody at home to walk the dogs and you know take care of the kids. Katie eventually um, moved out and became a producer, and she started working on this music musical. And her writing partner, a woman named Karen Harris who was one of the writers on a TV show called The Highlander. And they just started developing this project. And I wasn't really that interested in getting involved, but I was keeping an eye on it. And then they came over to my studio and did some demos here. And I got, kind of started getting sucked in. And then I get an email from my third cousin, who I, I had at that point I'd never even met, but in, a woman in England named Zelda Blackadder. Gorgeous name. Um, <laughs> and, really? And she's Oh, by the way, you have a cousin in L.A. who's writing a musical, and her name's Karen Harris. So it turns out that I'm working with my cousin and didn't know it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so I really couldn't kind of bail on the project at that point. Um, but it's actually, it's turned out to be an interesting show. So, you know, I've got a lot of stuff going on in terms of music and theater and then still working on studio projects and, you know, just really... Um, just having a life in music and when I'm not doing all of that and taking care of business for myself, I have a couple of schools in LA that I've adopted that I'm helping develop some curriculum for them to get the guitar programs really kind of building up to something of substance. So that's, really nice. uh, that's what I do. And I also I have a lecture recital that I do that's guitar mania to Beatle mania. That's the history <laughs> of the guitar. Some of that stuff that we were talking about earlier but it starts kind of in egyptian times and then rapidly moves forward to the point where once you get into the 19th century there's really lots of interesting stuff to talk about so uh, that's did you ever did you ever get to meet dan fogelberg never met him no okay but you're a fan of his music obviously i'm a fan of his songwriting i i think that you know having really kind of had to get inside these songs to do arrangements for them. It's that I think that especially lyrically, I think that he's just a fabulous poet, mm. you know, just a shame that he, he um, had to, you know, die as young as he mm. did. Right. Mm-hmm. I still, I see Tim Weisberg occasionally cause he's, he lives in the LA area and has actually come to some of my gigs. You know, Tim's oh. the flute player that did a duo album. Yeah. Oh yeah. Twin, twin sons of different yeah. brothers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All um, right. Well, anyway, I think I've got to go walk the dogs. <laughs> up, okay. They're ready. <laughs> there, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks very yeah. much. Thank you, Lawrence. Yeah. And see Thank you on June well. 1st in Portland. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. See you there. Yeah, I'll, I'll see the you at the, the cutting room in New York City in June. That's right. That's a week later. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Lawrence, cool. thanks so much for joining us. Bye bye. All right. Thanks. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, that was wonderful having that Lawrence was. from that was the show fun. with that us. Was, that was great. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So he's, he's always a great guest, and um, it's endless what he can talk about. Whether it's hey, even if you just want to get into the history of his work with Paul, or talking about the Beatles, or his own work, there's so many things to talk about. We got into yeah. we got into all sorts of stuff there. I mean, the the musicology stuff was quite interesting, even though yeah. I didn't. Under- even though I didn't understand most of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. That was really good. That was really yeah. good. So Well, Alan's going to have to give us a lesson, you know, uh, you yeah. know yeah. a, a <laughs> private right. lesson. Yeah. I mean, he really <laughs> is an incredible guitarist. I mean, you know, it's I listen to those arrangements and it's like, wow, wow, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, hearing him hearing him say that he had to put all that stuff into the song, uh, you know, you really you you listen to it and you take all that stuff for granted. But when you th- but after he said it, you have to think about it and go, yeah, that's not as easy as it as it, as it looks, you know. No. Yeah. So, right. 
and, and that's and, all live and it's not overdubbed. That's just right. you know that's him the playing it once. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and I'm listening to it as a guitarist myself, and just thinking, oh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I mean, you've got you've got people who like it's all they can do to play the the riff of Day Tripper, and he's got everything mm. else yeah. going on as well, and the riff is going too. So, yeah. Yeah. No, when it's I like, when I saw him when I saw him in Redwood City uh, a week or so ago, yeah, he he, you know. It's just him. It's not him and it's not him and anybody else. It's just him. So yeah, yeah. you know, it's wild. Anyway, there we go. So um, we have some news items to get to here, which we will close the show with. First of all, some good news about Ringo is the fact that once again he has announced that he's going to tour this year. And Steve, you can tell the folks a little bit more about that. Um, he's going to tour in October and November. It's going to be he's going to start out with eight days in Las Vegas, and then he's going to go through the South and come up through the Eastern Seaboard and end up in uh, New Jersey. I think it is. I think is the last show. I don't have the the link on my screen, but yeah. Uh, so he's going to end up uh, between New York and New Jersey for the last couple of shows. So there's a couple of things that that I find interesting about that, and that is that in the last few years. The question has been brought up to him whether or not he would do a residency in Las Vegas. And he said that it's something that he might consider. Um, he'd have to work out all the particulars. And he was even talking about having different members of the All-Stars for different shows. But eight shows in Las Vegas, you know, in the same hotel, that's, mm-hmm. that's uh, you know, that might be the start of where it's leading. Yeah. Especially mm-hmm. if he doesn't want to if he doesn't want to do the traveling, he could always do that. Right. So he'll, and then, be, he'll yeah. be, in essence, competing with love. <laughs> yes. Yes, he will be, actually. Yeah. Because he'll be there from uh, between October 13th and the 28th uh, for 10, uh, I believe it's, uh, is it 10 shows? Eight shows? I can't remember now. But, yeah, eight yeah. shows. Eight of shows. They, at the, at the, they could also sell packages where you go to love one night and Ringo another night. <laughs> that mm-hmm. would yeah. be nice, yeah. I could see that happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and also, if you follow most of his tours, they almost always start out in Toronto, <laughs> and then they end up in Los Angeles. Here, it starts in Las Vegas, and then it ends in on the East Coast. Yeah, so, the, uh, he, but we he, should he point goes, out neither neither in Portland, Maine, nor in Pittsburgh, um, as, as Al was, no. was complaining um, earlier. No, and he's, not, but, he's not in Connecticut either, for that matter. I know, I know, but you yeah. never know. He might he might add some dates. But the Beacon the Theater is a lot closer to Connecticut than, uh, right? That's true. Or, or <laughs> than it is to Pittsburgh. <laughs> right. Right. That's one of the things that I've noticed because on my website I like to post all the um, all the concerts for Beatles tribute bands and anybody that's that's uh, friends or musicians that have worked with the Beatles. Is that there are a lot of shows that happen in New York and Boston, and then you got to struggle a little bit in between. Yeah. So, uh, you know, those are such those are two major cities. And I guess if it's an artist who probably feels he can sell more shows, then you can work Connecticut and Rhode Island in. But um, otherwise, you know, it's it's one or the other. Right. Mm-hmm. New York, right. New, York, New York or Massachusetts. So. Right. Well, well whatever. of course, you've got you've got two two former New Yorkers here. So we can't really. Uh, you, you, know, also got a, much- you also got a Jersey boy here, too. Oh, sir. well. Mm. Well, yeah, right. But I was born in New York. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I wasn't born in Jersey, so there. Oh, okay. I well, had to you know, be there for, yeah. for a few years, though. So. <laughs> Living in New York and in Connecticut, I've been so spoiled. Because yeah. almost, every time, almost every time that Paul tours, he almost always does something in New York. Sure. So, uh, and same thing with Ringo. R- Ringo's actually done quite a lot of shows in New York and Connecticut. By, by the way... By the way, let me say something that uh, was kind of a cast off in the story that I wrote for Billboard the other day. I asked Paul's reps if there were going to be more shows, and they said, "We'll let you know." So take that for what it what it says. Mm. Take that for what it says, folks. Kind oh, of uh, uh, like a non denial denial or a non right. uh, yeah exactly. Agreement. <laughs> You're right. Right. No, I, I always think of that non denial denial from all the president's men. But yes, right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so well, there, we, there we go. You know that when you're dealing with record companies or publicists, they are not allowed to say anything until it's official. 
Right. And sometimes, sometimes their jobs are on the line if they do. So, you know, you don't expect them to even give you a hint. So the Beatles you know, have so. been very, very, very tight-lipped. It, it mm. didn't always used to be that way. If you remember, Ringo, there was an interview, I can't remember, it's been at least 10 years ago, where he actually said they were going to do something with, they were going to do something about Let It Be, I think he said. You'd never mm. hear him say that. You'd never hear him say that now. That's true. And when I interviewed Yoko the first time she she gave me the scoop about the John Lennon anthology, they would never, ever say that now. They wait until the official announcements. Ever. So that's one of the things that, that, you know, kind of when people speculate about, you know, about things, it's kind of really putting it out there and taking a chance because the Beatles do not reveal stuff. They don't. No. You know, so not anymore. We know this. You know, now that uh, we know that any day now the official word is going to leak about Sgt. Pepper right. and what the record company is going to do or what Apple's going to do, they haven't said anything. They're not going to say anything until it's official. That's their no. job. So, mm -hmm. nope. No, there's all sorts of rumination going on, but, you know, we'll find out when we find out. Mm -hmm. It should be this week, though. Hopefully, um, yes. Yeah. Anyway, um, some sad news to report. Uh, another major passing, and that is on the death of Pete Shotton, who, uh, you know, I think was a very important part of Beatles history, because depending upon what source you're referring to, uh, some people will say that Pete Shotton was John's closest friend in his childhood. You know, prior to having uh, Paul or Stu Sutcliffe, Pete Shotton was, was the one that he was closest to throughout uh, childhood and his teenage years. And, um, he does have some history there going back to, uh, you know, being in the Quarrymen and also uh, the fact that uh, he led the Apple Boutique. He was in charge of that and, and uh, a whole bunch of things. Guys, you want to comment on uh, Pete Shotton? No, no, I mean, I, there really isn't that much to say. I mean, I wrote a mm. big, long story and, and and you know, if you have his book, it's all it's all basically there. I mean, I think the friendship thing is the big thing. Uh, you know, he was a very very. He, I mean, some of the stories in the book about his friendship as a child. Uh, you know, at what they went through together. I mean, so you know, they yeah, were. We should, we should recommend the book anyway. Then. Yes. It's yeah. The yeah. book is. Yeah. Yeah, the book is really where to go. Uh, it's called In My Life, and it was co-written with Nicholas Schaffner, which I right. I've, I've forgotten about it that. Was, yeah, I dug, and and I until I dug it out for what I wrote. But yeah, so yeah, and and for that reason, uh, also that's another good reason to pick the book up is because Schaffner's mm -hmm. yeah. co-author. But that there's where you should you should go. Really, it it that's, there isn't really a whole lot to say. That's one of my favorite books on any of the Beatles. And as Bill, Bill Harry uh, issued a comment that Pete Shotton was one of the few people who would tell John off, who wouldn't put up with his BS. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons why John liked him so much. Mm -hmm. And he, he was there when John was riding Iron the Walrus, and um, he helped John remember the nursery rhyme that they used in, in, uh, in the song with the yellow amount of custard dripping from mm. a dead dog's eye coming from a nursery rhyme that they were brought up on. And he also and gave, he also gave Paul input on Eleanor Rigby. Came up with mm. Bobby well, Lindsay, apparently. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. So, well, very sad, uh, you know, a big part of John Lennon's life. And, uh, and also there is the story about the fact that he played the washboard in the quarrymen and he didn't, really enjoy doing it all that much and then there was a party where john actually john was drunk and he smashed the washboard on top of pete's head mm -hmm. so, so that was the end of his career with the quarryman so ouch ouch <laughs> and uh the last bit of news is uh what you are reporting steve about paul working on his new album mm-hmm yeah, I uh, um, he gave an interview to the BBC the other day um, uh, about uh, talking about his new album, uh, which I, I mean, which has kind of been known, but he, you know, got it out there with Matt Everett of BBC Radio Six and and said, you know, confirmed that it was being produced by Greg Kirsten, who worked with the Dull. And he did not say, and I checked with his reps about when the album would come out and. They're not saying, but we'll, 
you know, we'll find out when we find out, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but one of the, one of the things that was interesting in listening to that interview was him talking about working with El- Elvis Costello and saying it was like working with John Lennon, that they were that there was a parallel there, which was kind of interesting. Did he say uh, that before? Oh yeah. And it's, it's yeah. so yeah. obvious. You know, we, we next week we're we talking about flowers in the dirt. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are. So, yes, we are. You know, just as a, a, a slight preview, I mean, that set is so great that I think what he should do at this point is just put out his albums as the box sets with all the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful idea. Do you think he'll hear it? Are you listening, Paul? <laughs> Does he listen to us? <laughs> Who knows? He may not. We don't know. <laughs> he may not. Uh, right. He probably wouldn't. But yeah, no, so. that's a great, that, I, and you, you have have to wonder why some artists don't do that, or some artists haven't done that. That would be an interesting, uh, interesting thought. But in any event, okay, well, I, also yeah. I've got I have one piece of a little piece of housekeeping to take oh. care of. On last week's show, I was trying to remember uh, a George Harrison performance of yes. uh, of Johnny B. Good. And uh, one of our listeners, a fellow named uh, uh, David Rainey, who I think hmm. may be a friend of a couple of us on, uh, on Facebook, sure um, uh, sent me a message. And it turned out – and he was absolutely right. Uh, it turned out it was, at a, uh, it was at a concert in 1986 called Heartbeat 86 in uh, at the, at the M- NEC in Birmingham. Exactly. And uh, he uh, made a surprise. George made a surprise appearance and sang Johnny Be Good. Uh, it was March of 86. And David says, I think, for the uh, Birmingham Ching- uh, Children's Hospital. Right. And uh, highlights were broadcast here. Uh, David mentioned that he has, uh, has it on VHS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, I'm – I'm listening to the show, and I'm in I'm in the gym, and I'm and I'm you know, I'm yelling at myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course, people people along the track are wondering what the hell is he talking to himself about loudly. <laughs> and, it's what happens when you use Cambridge sixty nine as your music to exercise to. Huh? That's huh. it. Yeah, there we go. Exactly. There we that's go. It. Yeah, you and need we'll, the long version of two minutes of silence. That's what. <laughs> right. you need. <laughs> that way you'll be at peace with yourself. You'll right. collect thoughts. Your mind will be clear. Yes, and the uh, the the uh, extended twelve inch version of uh, uh, the, the the disco mix of uh, the Newtopian uh, International Anthem. There we okay. go. There we go. By the way, I think David actually paid us the highest compliment on Facebook. I believe he said that he's been listening to things we said today since the first episode. So he's been wow. with us since the very beginning. Thank yeah. you so much, David. Big Thank hugs you. from all of us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. And since you just brought up Chuck Berry, and you reminded me of something there, Steve, the interview that Paul gave on BBC Radio, which I have heard, he does talk about Chuck Berry there, and he actually plays a little bit on acoustic guitar of Come Together faster and relating to how similar that was to You Can't Catch Me. Mm-hmm. So it's right there in the interview, mm. and, it, and it's cool to hear Paul sing it that way and to play the guitar to it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Well, this this has been a great show, and uh, before we go, why don't we give the folks some information how they can get in contact with us? First, with Steve. Well, they can write to us at Things We Said Today Radio Show at Gmail dot com. We have a Facebook page called Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fan, that you can join. Uh, and we're on Twitter at Things We Said Fab. Okay. And Al, how about you? Uh, the, the, the usual uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, uh, Twitter at ASUSS49, or uh, Beatle Fan Magazine, www.beatlefan.com. And Alan? And basically the same deal, um, Facebook under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix, and I'm on Twitter at, at Cozen. And All you right. can also reach us at the, uh, the show page. And you can, you can reach me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. 
Okay. And as for me, Ken Michaels, a couple of things I want to bring up. First of all, I'm going to be making a special appearance on uh, WFDU, which is Fairleigh yeah. Dickinson University. Every Little Thing airs on that station. And I was interviewed by one of their great DJs there, Ghosty, who hosts yeah. the program The Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. I'm going to be on this coming Sunday, which is April the 2nd, sometime between 12 and 3 p.m. And uh, part of the reason why I'm on the show is because I'm celebrating my 35th anniversary since starting my Beatles show on College Radio in 1982 uh, on WNYT in Old Westbury, the College Radio Station. So I'm talking about my history, and I'm pretty sure we bring up things we said today in that show. I've been doing a lot of interviews, so that's, that's one of them. So if you get a chance... You can visit their uh, website, which is WFDU.FM, and bring up their main uh, signal, the HD1 signal for mm -hmm. that, this Sunday from 12 to 3. I also have a special contest starting on my website on Tuesday, which is March the 28th, and it involves winning the special edition of Flowers in the Dirt, which is the CD with the bonus, with a bonus CD of the nine demos of Paul and Elvis together, the acoustic demos, and uh, you also have a choice of winning that on vinyl as well, on my special contest, and on my trivia page, Beatles Trivia and Games page, that's one of the nine prizes they could pick from, that's starting this week, and very soon on my website I'll be giving away tickets to see Denny Lane in concert at Daryl's house in Pauling, New York, that's on April the 28th, so a lot of things are going on on my website which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. There you go. All right, this has been an amazing show. And so, for Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, and our special guest, Lawrence Juber, this is Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening. And we will see you next time. <laughs>